Well, it's good to see you all this morning. And before I go any further, I, I want to pause and I want to thank you all so very much for the many prayers and messages uh, that I've received. Um, as Wayne mentioned last week, my wife Molly, who's seven months pregnant, came down with COVID. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for your prayers and happy to announce that she's recovered, tested negative, and, and is back on her feet. And I also want to take a moment to thank Dwayne uh, and Mrs. Kate Gibbon for, for jumping in and helping to cover uh, during the communion preparation celebration. So I'm, I'm very grateful. Over the last several months, as I began my ministry here among you at Grace and Holy Trinity, I have become very familiar with this beautiful church building. Over the summer months, as we refurbished the church floors that are here, I and, and several others got so familiar with the woodwork that we came to know exactly which parts of the floor would creak when you walked on them. And as we've worked to improve and enhance our sound system, I and others have become intimately aware how sound travels and doesn't travel in this space. <laughs> And as I've worked with others to improve our heating and our lighting and our electrical systems, I've wiggled my way into pretty much every nook and cranny in this building above and below and everywhere in between. And as I've helped to lead worship here, I've gained a much deeper appreciation for the holiness of this space, how it frames and, and nurtures and sustains our worship just as it's done for generations of people before us, and God willing, as it will for generations to come. Just like you all, I marvel at the beauty of this church, and I am blessed and deeply grateful to worship God with you all among it. But as I encountered this morning's gospel text from Luke, I was challenged to think carefully about what the bricks and mortar of our church buildings mean in light of Jesus' prophecy about the destruction of the temple. The reading begins with people marveling over the beauty of the temple, the enormous stones of its walls, the worshipers coming to dedicate their gifts to God. And then when Jesus sees this, he interrupts them with the not-so-uplifting prophecy that the whole thing would fall to the ground every last stone. And this is before he begins to describe to them the series of apocalyptic events that would have to take place, including wars and insurrections and famines and plagues. And even before it gets personal, before Jesus tells the disciples that they themselves will be arrested, persecuted, hated by the world for following him. This is one of those gospel readings that has me scratching my head wondering, so what's the good news? It's not a stretch to find our experience of the pandemic and some of the violence that we've seen in our world over the last several years to find that in this reading from Luke's gospel. It has been a scary time. In a way, the experience of coming back to church, this sacred structure, after being away from it from pandemic, connects us with the people marveling at the beauty of the temple, dedicating gifts to God that adorn it. We love this place, and we are so grateful to be back in it. Thanks be to God. But this gospel reading and our shared experience of the pandemic point towards an easily forgotten but essential truth about temples and churches, and more importantly, about who we really are as the people of God. During the pandemic, faith communities like ours carried on by meeting over Zoom, outdoors, and in other creative ways. We were forced to be the church outside of the bricks and mortars of our buildings. Some of you may recall that earlier this summer in, in a homily that I gave, I told you the story, the story of what became the Episcopal Church in Virginia. Early people without clergy who were loyal to the crown and had to return to England during the Revolutionary War, and in some cases without church buildings, gathered to pray the daily office in their homes with family and friends. And the church survived. It carried on. And in many ways, this reminds me of how we endured the pandemic. And we proved to be just as resilient and resourceful as our forebears were. And while we were physically separated from one another, the daily stress of the pandemic 
grew us closer in ways that we could not have possibly imagined. We were forced to slow down. We checked in on one another. We reconnected with old friends. We forgave one another. We said, I love you more often. And when we asked one another, how are you doing? We got more honest and real answers. And now as we emerge from the pandemic, there is an impulse in churches everywhere to rush back into the old ways of doing church, to marvel at the beauty of our church buildings, the strength of our programs, to fill our pews as quickly as possible, to get things back to normal, or to move quickly towards a new, bigger, better normal. With this kind of thinking, this kind of marveling at the temple, we're missing the important lesson that the pandemic taught us about who we truly are as followers of Jesus. T.S. Eliot says, we had the experience, but missed the meaning. Let's not fall into this trap. Let's pause, slow down, and pay attention to what might be the lessons of the last two or three years. The pandemic taught us to be more compassionate, a word that literally means to suffer together. And at the root of compassion is another word, passion, which means suffering, which is the word that the Gospels use to describe Jesus' suffering and his experience on his journey to and through the cross. Passion or suffering is exactly what Jesus is reminding his disciples they will face in his name's sake in this reading. And passion is what unites us as Christians to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And our shared experience of passion in the face of wars, insurrection, famines, pandemics, and persecution is an important part of who we are as Christians called out of the ways of the world and into the beautiful mystery of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and joining into this beautiful mystery through baptism is the true source of our hope. Now, I, don't want, you, I want you all to know how deeply thrilled I am to be back in this space on Sunday mornings to worship God with you, and I am thrilled and grateful and excited that our programs are up and running with new vision and with new focus and with new commitment and that we're making strides to improve this beautiful campus so that it can support our beloved community for years to come. But let's be careful not to rush too quickly towards resurrection. It's easy for us to be seduced into focusing primarily on the material aspects of what it means to be a community of faith. Just as those standing outside of the temple were marveling at its size and its beauty and the gifts that, of the gifts that adorned it. But Jesus is teaching us here that the material things are not the things that last. Jesus is teaching us that what truly defines us as Christians is not the strength and size of our buildings or our wealth or our programs. It's how well we share one another's burdens. It's how we forgive one another. It's how well we love one another. The strength and quality of our community cannot be measured primarily in material terms. These things are no doubt important, but they are not the end all. The true measure of our success as a community of faith is our compassion. It's our openness to one another's suffering and to the suffering of the world outside these walls. And here's where we get to the good news. Suffering. And struggle is a part of our human experience. And the pandemic reminded us of that in a profound way. But there is not a marvelous and mighty church edifice in the world that will ever change that. But our suffering, our passion, is not the end of our story, just as it was not the end of Jesus' story. Beloved friends, we are a people of the resurrection, and the more willing we are to let go of our attachment to material things that ultimately distract us from who we are as the people of God, the more likely we are to grow into new life through the resurrection and hope of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.